So a few months ago, maybe eight months ago now, um, I was invited by Father Jim Heft at the Institute for the Advanced Studies of Culture at the University of Southern California. Um, and uh, by he and a colleague of his, Jan Stetz, who is a professor of sociology at the University of California, Riverside, uh, to consider submitting something for an edited volume that they were putting together on religious uh, disaffiliation. So this whole phenomenon of people who uh, no longer have any religious preference, uh, the so-called nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Um, and there were a number of scholars coming from different disciplines who had already attached themselves to the volume, many of whom um, I'm big fans of their work. Um, and obviously, Father Heft, I've read many of his great books, including some of his work on Catholic high schools. It's relevant to some of my other research. Um, and so I, I knew I wanted to be part of the project, but I couldn't quite figure out what my um, unique contribution to that volume might be. Um, and then it occurred to me that I might be able to use this as an opportunity to bring together uh, sort of my two streams of research. As Tom mentioned, I've done a lot of work on Catholic K-12 education, but I also have a number of publications in the area of religious non-affiliation. So uh, I decided to pitch the idea of looking at Catholic disaffiliation specifically, sort of understanding who uh, lapsed Catholics are. Um, I was, as I agreed to do the project, um, I realized I had a lot of other demands on my time and thought, oh, goodness, how am I going to make this happen? Um, and I often write papers with undergraduate students um, at Loyola. And at the time, I had a very, uh, very talented uh, recent graduate serving as my teaching assistant in my social statistics class, Ashlyn Haycook. She was um, a sociology major. Uh, she was also a major in French really talented young woman who uh, happens to love statistics. Um, a rare breed, but uh, was delighted to find her in several of my classes. And I approached her about sort of coming on and helping with some of the analyses. So I just wanted to give her a shout out. She's going to be a co-author on this chapter when it appears. And I'm in the final stages of edits on this. Um, it's actually due November 1st, and then it'll be sent off to um, Oxford University Press. So. If you have any thoughts or suggestions as I move through, I, I definitely welcome them because there's still time for me to possibly squeeze them in. Um, so I am going to uh, just jump right in. And OK, there we go. So I'm a sociologist of religion. And sociologists of religion have really developed rich cumulative knowledge about religious belief and practice and the intersection of those things with other aspects of social life. So it's very common for sociologists of religion to examine the relationship between religion and voting or religion and volunteering, religion and family formation, uh, religion and attitudes towards abortion, um, re religion and attitudes towards um, uh, same-sex marriage, all kinds of things. Um, but for many years, you know, we didn't consider uh, non-affiliation or, or non-religion. You know, it was the case in the U.S. context in particular that there were just very few um, atheists or agnostics, um, you know, sort of right up until the 80s, it would have been just um, three or four percent of the U.S. population. But starting in the early 90s, sociologists um, started to notice that there were more folks uh, who, when they were surveyed about their religious affiliation, their denomination um, of choice or of birth, um, that they responded kind of other, nothing in particular. Um, and they got given this name, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. And it's stuck, and it's unfortunate because it's not a great name. You know, it, it is uh, a name that defines people by the absence of something, not by the presence of something. Um, and so since that time in the sociology of religion, we've really been interested in learning more about who this group is. You know, are they atheists, uh, folks who don't believe? Are they, um, you know, just 
sort of um, nothing in particular, you know, not that they're non-believers or that they don't want a religion, they just don't happen to have um, a church home right now. And so folks, especially in the last 10 years, have really just uh, participated in an explosion of research on on religious nuns. So we know that there's a lot of diversity within the group from this research. So it turns out that most of these folks are not atheists. There actually is a relatively high level of belief in God among these folks who claim no religious preference. Um, many of them actually still occasionally go to church. Um, they just don't have a, a church home or an affiliation that they want to claim. What we know less about in the scholarly uh, research on this area is what we would call disaffiliation. So not, um, not having an affiliation, but the process by which you go about leaving your um, religious tradition that you had at one point. And we do have some uh, research on switching. You know, um, it's always been the case that uh, Americans in particular uh, might switch uh, from being Catholic to being Protestant or from being Protestant to being Catholic or, um, you know, within the various um, denominations um, and uh, uh, religious groups within Protestantism. But we know much, much less about lapsing. And so in this project, I'm very interested in understanding who these kind of Catholics are that are in the middle. They're not quite secular, but they're not regular um, churchgoers either. Um, so fortunately, there are, are some places that I can go as a social scientist to look into this uh, phenomenon, and that's what I'm going to share with you tonight. So just as a little bit of background to the analysis that, um, that I did myself, uh, what has become clear in recent years is that there are a lot of former Catholics. Um, according to the folks at the Pew uh, uh, Charitable Trust who do work on religion, um, there are so many former Catholics that 13% of the U.S. population is actually a former Catholic. Um, and a, of those, about half have converted to some kind of Protestantism, and the other half uh, are these folks that we're talking about tonight um, that sort of have no uh, new affiliation. And this phenomenon actually explains a couple of other important things that are happening in the church. So uh, the Catholic population in the United States has, has really held steady over the last um, 20 years. It's, it's currently about one in four, about 25% of Americans are Catholic. Um, but it's steady, it's not growing. Um, and that might su be surprising if we think about the fact that um, new immigrants to the United States are often from um, home countries uh, and backgrounds that suggest that they're disproportionately Catholic. Um, and Catholics still have higher than average fertility. It's been going down a little bit, but Catholics still have um, more children on average than um, than some other religious groups. So this disaffiliation is leading um, to sort of a steady state, but you could imagine that it might um, shift at some point in the future to uh, an overall declining Catholic population. So I was able to do some further digging into this phenomenon by examining a data set called the Pew Religious Landscapes Survey. Um, Pew, for those of you who don't know, um, is a, a major think tank that does uh, public opinion research on all kinds of um, things related to American social and political life. But they have a, an entire branch that does work on religion in public life. If you Google Pew, um, you'll find their website, which is just a treasure trove of um, brief pieces that pull out data on American religion. Um, just a, a great resource. They're also very committed to um, publicly accessible scholarship and sharing their resources. And so all of the data that they use to 
put together their reports um, is freely available to the public. You can download it from their uh, from their website. So for any of you um, out there tonight who are um, students or uh, working maybe on some uh, assignments or just a lifelong learner that is, that's very curious about this topic, um, you can certainly go and check out some of these uh, resources for yourself. Uh, the reason I chose the 2014 Pew Religious Landscape Survey is that it has a very large sample size by social scientific standards. It has about 35,000 respondents. Um, and the reason that that is important is to do this kind of um, statistical digging, so to speak, I needed enough people who were raised Catholic that I could disentangle um, different groups and still have enough people in each of those groups uh, to conduct a rigorous analysis. So in this data set, um, it was con a survey conducted in 2014, uh, there were about 11,000 respondents who were raised Catholic. And by raised Catholic, I mean they answered yes to a survey question that said, uh, what was your religion at age 16? So it's not perfect, but um, you know it is a proxy for uh, religion of origin. Of those 11,000 respondents, uh, almost 3,800 are still Catholic today, so they've maintained their uh, religious affiliation throughout their life. And uh, about 2,800 are what we might call lapsed. Um, and that's, they still say they're Catholic, but they don't attend church more than once or twice a year. Um, outside of wedding and funerals. So um, these might be folks we would call Christmas and Easter Catholics, folks who come to mass a couple times a year but aren't particularly engaged in church life. Then there are about 1,500 respondents who are these nothing in particular folks. Um, you know, they're not uh, atheist or agnostic, I'll get to those in a second, but they are um, not part of a traditional religious group. And then there are a small number who will identify with the label agnostic or atheist, about 400 ag agnostics and then about 300 atheists. So in this project, oh, I'm sorry, the uh, slide, the last letter of, in my column, it looks a little different here. Um, I apologize for that. I'm also new to Blackboard Collaborate. But um, in this project, I wanted to compare this group of stable Catholics, so people who were raised Catholic and are still Catholic today, with those that were raised Catholic and are now lapsed, those that were raised Catholic and now don't have an affiliation, and those that were raised Catholic that are now atheist or agnostic. So the percentages that I'm about to show you are not um, of the general population, they are uh, of folks who are raised Catholic and are now this other thing. Uh, so. I'll just kind of walk you through um, some of the most important aspects of the numbers in this table. Uh, so we can see from this that lapsed Catholics still have very, very high belief in God. 96.9% um, of them still believe in God. And this is, of course, very different than the folks that are now atheists, although somewhat confusingly, about 8% of atheists in this survey say they believe in God. Not sure what's, what's happening there, although this is um, heavy, complicated stuff. Um, about, you know, 50% of the agnostics uh, would say they believe in God, which, which sounds about right for folks who are sort of trying to figure out one way or another what they believe. Um, and about 80% of those that have no affiliation uh, right now do believe in God. So a lot, a lot of scholarly literature that confirms this, um, but not as much attention in the scholarly literature to those that are lapsed. So this is sort of interesting to see. Um, then I looked at religion's importance to daily life. So percentage of people who say that religion is important or somewhat important to their daily life. Um, good news for those of us involved in, um, in ministry or who care about the future of the church. Uh, 
98.5% of the respondents who were stably Catholic said religion was important uh, to their lives. But that kind of goes down as you move across these categories. So um, about 78, 79% of those that are lapsed would say that they uh, agree or or strongly agree that, or sorry, that religion is important or somewhat important to their daily life. Um, and that makes intuitive sense if we think about why these folks um, still claim an affiliation, but are no longer, you know, attending mass. Uh, I also looked at prayer. So about 73% of people who've been Catholic uh, growing up and are still Catholic today uh, say they pray every day. Uh, but only 41% of those that are lapsed would say that, um, and very little prayer among the other groups that we would you know, sort of say are, are more traditionally secular. Because of some of my previous research on schools and socialization, I was really interested in looking at um, how these behaviors might um, vary or look among uh, the respondents with children. Um, so I looked at an item in this data set that asks about whether um, the respondent prays or reads scripture with their children. 76.7% um, of the practicing Catholics in the survey said that they did this. 42% uh, of the lapsed Catholics said that they did. Um, and then again, it kind of goes down from there. 60% of Catholics um, sent their a child to religious education. In the Catholic context, um, this would mean uh, CCD. Uh, about a third of the lapsed Catholics did, which is interesting. You know, they're not going to church with any regularity, but apparently they're, they're maybe dropping their kid off to um, some weekend or, or after school um, religious education. So again, that's another indication that these folks are sort of halfway in, halfway out of, of the church in some ways. Another really interesting thing, although this is a bit of an aside, um, is that about 20% of the folks that were raised Catholic who themselves are atheists now, um, send their child to religious education. Um, so if you're interested in education and socialization, that's a kind of interesting finding because it suggests that there is a group of atheists out there who, um, who still want their children to experience some sort of religious community or religious training. Um, because of my work on Catholic K-12 schools, I was particularly interested in this last item, which was, uh, do you send your child to a religious school instead of public school? Um, it didn't specify the denomination of the religious school, but one would hope for Catholics that that would be a Catholic school. Um, and only about 21% of the stable Catholics um, do that, um, and very few of the other groups do, which unfortunately is consistent with some of my other research on, on Catholic education. So in order to kind of think a little bit about, you know, what is it about religious organizations or religious institutions that might be preventing these lapsed Catholics, these folks that, you know, have an, a strong enough att of attachment to the church that they would still claim that label for themselves. Uh, but, you know, are not not going to mass on the weekends, you know, um, is there something about the church uh, or churches in general that's sort of turning them off? Um, and fortunately, in this survey, there was some really rich data on um, attitudes towards churches and other religious organizations. So one hypothesis that's out there in the literature, it's not specific to Catholics, it's, it's much more general, is that the um, rise of people claiming no affiliation actually corresponds in some ways to the growth of the religious right. This is usually an argument made more about um, evangelical Protestants, but the, the scholars who make it suggest that um, there's a subset of people who just got turned off by politics and churches and conservative politics in, in particular. They sort of came to see those two things as being tightly entwined and because um, their politics didn't match what they were seeing in the churches, they sort of thought, this is not a space for me. I am, um, I'm not one of those kind of people. Um, and they haven't found kind of a, um, 
a religious left in the same way that there's a religious right. You know, a contested argument, but that's sort of out there. So I think that's kind of the impetus for Pew um, investigating this first item. Churches and other religious organizations are too involved in politics. Um, and there we see um, that about 40%, well, I shouldn't round up that much, 38% of, of the Catholic respondents, uh, folks raised Catholic, still Catholic today, would, uh, would agree with that statement, which is kind of interesting. And it goes up um, as you move across the categories. So about half of the lapsed Catholics sort of say that. Um, churches and religious organizations focus too much on the rules. Um, about 45% of practicing Catholics agree with that statement. Um, and again, it goes up across the category. So 60% of lapsed Catholics um, feel that same way. Churches and other religious organizations are too concerned with money and power. 43.3% uh, of the stably Catholic feel that way. Um, and that jumps up to 60% roughly for the folks that are um, identifying as Catholic but not attending mass. Um, and as, as with all of these um, items in this table that I'm showing you right now, uh, this, these sort of consistently go up as you move across the folks that are um, not affiliated at all, the ag agnostic and atheist. Uh, churches and other religious organizations protect and strengthen morality in society. So this is kind of a reverse question where it, you, you want folks to be agreeing with that statement. Um, and 86.4% of, of folks who are raised Catholic who are still Catholic agreed with that statement. Um, and 75.7% of the lapsed Catholics did. So um, as was the case with the religious um, socialization of children, we see some evidence that even if folks are not actively practicing or believing themselves, um, that they still feel like there could be a, a positive role for churches and religious organizations in society at large. Churches and other religious organizations bring people together and strengthen community bonds. This one is even more clear. The majority of the respondents in the survey who were raised Catholic, regardless of what they um, believed today or believed when they were surveyed in 2014, pretty strongly agree with this statement. Even 75% of the atheist respondents believe that churches and other religious organizations bring people together and strengthen community bonds. And the good news is the social scientific research uh, suggests that they're right. There's lots of work on religion and civic engagement that suggests that folks who are active in their religious communities are also active in other types of charitable enterprises, even those not connected to their religious organization, they, they give more philanthropically and not just to their churches, but to lots of other um, causes in society. Churches and religious other religious organizations play an important role in helping the poor and the needy. Again, lots of agreement um, with this, a little bit more so among the practicing Catholics, but still a lot of support for um, this idea in general. And the last part was cut off, so I'll just um, uh, skip past that one. I'm, I apologize. So another hypothesis you might have about why um, uh, folks are, um, you know, not attending church anymore is uh, that they might have uh, positions that are different than official church teaching on some social issues. So I wanted to look into whether um, folks who are not attending mass anymore are um, likely to support abortion, um, more likely to support homosexuality or same-sex marriage. Um, so that's the first four items um, on the table. I'll walk through those and then I'll talk about the case of volunteering, which is a slightly different thing, but um, it made sense to include them all in this, uh, in this table. So um, we see here that uh, only 12% of the folks that were raised Catholic, who are still Catholic today, 
think that abortion should be legal in all cases. That's probably very troubling to some of you who um, are, you know, uh, uh, strong pro-life advocates, but uh, it's still a very small number of Catholics. Um, but this creeps up as you move through the different um, uh, alternative uh, beliefs that folks have today. So among those who were raised Catholic but don't um, attend church that often, 23% uh, of those folks think abortion should be legal in all, in all cases. Um, and 50% of, of the folks that were raised Catholic who are now atheists believe that. Um, you know, a more moderate view, abortion should be legal in most cases. Uh, same pattern, but we see even more um, agreement with, with that statement. Um, large numbers of uh, folks who were raised Catholic um, and, and folks who are currently Catholic believe homosexuality should be accepted by society. In this survey, 64% um, of uh, folks who were raised Catholic who are currently Catholic uh, said that they uh, agreed with that statement. 77.4% um, of those who uh, were raised Catholic but don't attend church that often anymore. And then moving on up, you know, into the the mid 90s for agnostics and atheists. Um, interestingly, there is a, a distinction consistent with church teaching about, uh, you know, difference between sort of uh, human dignity of, of, of homosexual persons versus um, uh, marriage. And so there we see uh, kind of a, a much bigger difference between practicing Catholics and those that identify and uh, no longer attend. So uh, while 37% of uh, practicing Catholics favor um, gay marriage, uh, that jumps up quite a bit to 66% to among those who are no longer attending. So that might be some minor support for the idea that um, some of these folks who retain the Catholic identity um, are not attending or active in the community anymore because they um, don't find the church's position on gay marriage uh, consistent with their own views. So uh, as a sociologist, a lot of the work that I've done in the past um, has been on volunteering and civic engagement. That's a topic that I'm, I'm very interested in. And so I wanted to look as well at this measure in the survey about whether folks had volunteered in the last, the last seven days. Um, and consistent with the literature on volunteering, uh, the folks that are kind of more involved, uh, still going to mass and active in a religious community, were more likely to volunteer, uh, but not not necessarily substantially more so. Um, you know, for example, 28% of folks who are atheists are still volunteering. What's most interesting to me is that the lapsed group, those uh, that are not uh, not going to mass anymore are the lowest of all the categories, which suggests to me that perhaps uh, what's going on here is that these are not just folks that are not involved in churches, they might be folks that are not involved in anything. You know, they're just not joiners, they're not sort of out there in their communities. Unfortunately, with just this item alone, I can't tell you what they are doing, but it suggests that this um, disengagement from religious organizations. Uh, might be tied to kind of a, a more general disengagement from society. So just a couple of other findings, because I do want to leave us time for discussion. Uh, I looked at a couple of socio-demographic uh, variables uh, that, or characteristics, uh, to see if, if lapsed Catholics were more common, you know, among men or among women, among uh, certain race and ethnic categories, among certain age groups, among um, certain parts of the country. Um, and the two findings that really stuck out in that analysis were that lapsed Catholics, um, again, those that were raised Catholic but no longer go to, to Mass, still retain the identity, um, are much more likely to have a non-Catholic spouse. Um, so one might wonder there whether what's happening is that there's just uh, sort of 
do we go to your church? Do we go to mine? Uh, we go to no church instead. Um, I, I think it would take some qualitative interviewing uh, to really, or a different set of survey questions to get a firm answer to that. But um, that was an interesting finding. The other um, one that stuck out was that on average, Latin Catholics have a little bit lower education. So they're more likely to be in that just have a high school degree um, group. And uh, one of the things that that made me wonder is whether um, churches are elite spaces, you know, that they're middle and upper middle class uh, uh, places that uh, more working class people uh, don't feel comfortable kind of socializing or engaging in fellowship. Again, that's more speculation on my part in terms of what this um, finding means, but um, I, I think it's interesting to think about that. So in terms of my own, um, you know, next steps with this project, um, it's been suggested to me that it'd be really interesting to look at other types of disaffiliates, even though we don't call them lapsed Protestants usually. Um, we surely could find some lapsed Protestants, folks who were raised in a Protestant tradition, uh, who maybe still maintain that identity as Baptist or Methodist, who, who no longer uh, really go to services. Um, you know, I have to confess that's not as interesting to me as the Catholic questions, but it's an important question, so I might I might take that on as a, a another project. Um, a project that is interesting to me, um, but it's been harder for me as a social scientist to think about the right data to answer is a question about kind of cultural Catholics, people who um, maybe don't even go to mass, but uh, you know, not even Christmas and Easter, but they consider themselves Catholic on the basis of their ethnicity. Um, so they're Irish Catholic or they're Italian Catholic. I, I, the way I'm thinking about this is a lot um, akin to the way people talk about cultural Judaism, you know, so not Jewish by faith, but Jewish by, um, by culture. And, you know, uh, the nature of this statistical work uh, you know, while, while good at kind of setting an overall picture, uh, leaves us with a lot of questions in terms of the process, you know. So uh, I would be very interested in the future in, uh, in some uh, getting the opportunity to track people over the life course. Um, social scientists would call this panel data where you sort of interview people, uh, the same people every few years and see you know, what they're up to. And um, I'm very interested in sort of the idea that uh, it's, it's probably likely that people move in and out of the lap status. So you might imagine, um, you know, folks going to church pretty consistently in their childhood with their parents, uh, maybe lapsing uh, when they're in college, although hopefully not at Loyola, our wonderful Catholic college, but, um, you know, maybe they attend less uh, in college and then, uh, as they have children and families of their own, uh, returning, uh, returning to church, maybe stepping out again for a few years and then returning um, uh, later in life after retirement. Um, with the data that I used in this project, it's just not able, we're not really able to examine that kind of process or go kind of deep into the nuance. So um, as folks who might be practitioners who care deeply about, um, you know, whether there's something that can be done about this phenomenon of lapsing, um, I just wanted to point out two things that might be of interest. You may have heard of these already because they've gotten some good press in the Catholic media, um, but uh, I think they, they're they're particularly well suited for people who are interested in this from a practitioner angle. Um, so St. Mary's Press has put out this volume, Going, Going, Gone, The Dynamics of Disaffiliation Among Young Catholics, uh, in partnership with the Center for Applied Research on the Apostolate at Georgetown University. They did some um, surveying and also a lot of interviews with um, young people in particular um, to learn about why they were leaving the church. Um, and in that volume, they uh, suggest that people interested in addressing the phenomenon might think about these um, three questions. They, they encourage a lot of reflection on other topics as well, but I wanted to kind of point out these three 
in case they um, spurred future discussion. I won't read them out because um, you know we're. I want to leave enough time in our in our hour webinar for um, some discussion if people have uh, have questions. The other that's really fun, especially given the title of this paper, um, from nuns to nuns, um, and uh, the phenomenon in general is there is this organization. Actually, Tom pointed this group out to me of uh, of nuns who are engaging in dialogue with uh, with millennials in particular, who may be non-believers, um, bringing. Uh, the two groups together over fellowship to sort of think about, uh, you know, why why folks are are less interested in their um, traditional religious practice than perhaps previous uh, generations. So they've got a great website. There's an article about them in America Magazine a couple of months ago. Uh, another thing to sort of think about and perhaps a model for talking about this in future. So I think I'll end it there. Um, I'm going to be happy to answer questions or to hear about your own experiences, either in your work or in your home life with this phenomenon. But I'll turn it over um, to Tom at this point. All right. Thank you, Carolyn. So now is the time for conversation. I, I was thinking of some implications for ministry, but how about you? What I mean, do you did you as you were going through this, did you think of any uh, ideas? Well, we maybe this is something that could be done, or or one way of responding to these things. Yeah, it's certainly an important question. Um, the one thing that came to mind to me was when um, I first sort of discovered that finding about lots of Catholics being of, of lower education typically than other Catholics. And, and thinking about that idea that maybe uh, churches have become uh, elite spaces or, or kind of uh, tight-knit uh, communities, which are, is great, but maybe they are intimidating to, uh, to folks um, from other parts of the of the community, and that that made me think that uh, you know one of the impl implications for folks in uh, parish life and ministry is sort of uh, having programming that's um, you know that uh, that really reaches out to different types of parishioners. You know, uh, I know it's really hard work, but sort of getting away from programming that kind of appeals to the the folks that that always come out and uh, and do all the events. Um, you know, uh, I feel like maybe there are some uh, some types of events that would be would be more. Um, more appealing or less intimidating for a new newcomer or someone who hasn't been as involved to to get engaged in. Um, another thing that um, actually came up when I presented this work at an academic conference, uh, I was on a panel with someone who was examining something um, so similar among Southern Baptists. Uh, she pointed out that in her research, um, there she was finding that a lot of folks uh, who were single parents uh, who had had children out of wedlock felt very um, stigmatized by going to their Southern Baptist churches that they sort of felt like they had um, they were still believers but they felt like they would be judged by the church folks if they went back into the into the pews and and I wonder um, you know given some church teaching around um, sexual ethics, whether there are folks in the Catholic community um, or in the community of, of, of believers who maybe don't have that traditional two-parent family uh, anymore who are sort of alienated from, from churches. Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. I want to uh, uh, put up, put the, up the, the, just remind folks that you can type your questions in the bottom right-hand side and, uh, um, and, and uh, uh, or comments, questions or comments. Let me let me follow up on that uh, because my impression that is that there are other Christian churches who that uh, appeal maybe to people with less education more successfully. 
you know, I think they're, they're storefront churches and things like that, that that would draw that. So maybe I'm wondering if, if, if this may be more dis, a distinctively Catholic problem, you know, that, and, and not just a general church problem. And then a, 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 an English speaking Catholic problem, because my sense is that, you know, one of the, the fast, the, the, you know, the, the U S Catholic church will, I don't know, assume be majority Hispanic, but a large number of Hispanics. And I think that uh, um, uh, my experience of Hispanic Catholics is there, there's a wide range of educational levels. Uh, so, um, so I'm wondering if that is uh, an issue that's more directed to, um, you know, kind of Anglo uh, Catholic as opposed to just, you know, Christian churches in general. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's correct. Um, unfortunately, there weren't a large enough number of Latino Catholics in this survey to treat them as a separate category, because I really do think um, in some ways we have uh, two distinct churches uh, mm-hmm. or, two, or mm-hmm. two distinct communities of um, of believers, and it would have been interesting to kind of compare those groups on these various measures. Hmm, that's interesting. And just a, a, a plug for our program, we, we actually offer a certificate in theology and, and ministry in Spanish uh, and have a number of groups going and that, that are very excited about it. You know, another thing that struck me from your data was um, that maybe uh, one way of, of responding is to highlight the high points where say like atheists the things we're interested are um and i i was really struck by the the the, um three things that is attention to community the importance of community uh you know the respect of religion for the poor and needy and then also the religious education was was kind of interesting that 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 as like something like 20 percent of the people of who consider themselves atheists still sent their kids to religious education. So, um, you know, so maybe that's one, uh, maybe that's another way to, to meet people where they are and where their interests are, is, is, is somehow to emphasize community, somehow to emphasize concern for the poor and needy and to have opportunities for religious education that more available. Yeah, I do think that that is a positive, and um, it's interesting to look at some places in Europe um, when we think about these things. So um, often Europe is thought of as this uh, very secular kind of place now, as obviously has a rich religious history, but compared to the United States, very low levels of belief and practice. Um, And Germany has... um, uh, Oh, gosh, I'm, I'm hoping it's Germany. I'm, it's getting a little late. My brain's uh, tired. But uh, there are some countries in Europe that have uh, taxes, you know, to, to pay for religious buildings, ma- maintenance of churches, those sorts of things, state uh, state churches. And uh, you would think in a really secular society where very few people are practicing anymore that there might be some sort of, you know, wait a minute, I don't want to pay for these institutions anymore. Um, But the research on Europe has suggested um, there's this really great book called Religion as Chain of Memory by Danielle Hervaux-Léger, a a French sociologist who who says, um, you know, uh, people don't want religion to disappear. You know, even folks that don't practice, they're very concerned about the idea that it would disappear. You know, that there's kind of a, a nostalgia or a fondness for religion and a value that's placed on it but um but you know uh that that's maybe not the same as as uh as actually attending i'm seeing some questions here on the side um one question how can all this these groups get consensus um given that they have different beliefs and ideologies that is a great question um you know uh consensus is certainly a very difficult um, thing to achieve across a variety of contexts, not just um, just religious contexts. But I mean, I do think we have some theological tools. Um, some of you in the audience probably know these much better than I do that sort of think about uh, ways to kind of bridge 
bridge difference. And um, I wonder if part of what needs to happen first is just that people need to acknowledge the difference, appreciate the difference, um, and sort of start that conversation. I hope that answers your question. Um, and then second question, uh, are you familiar with what impact conservative youth ministry programs like Life Teen or Steubenville conferences uh, are having concerning future affiliations of young adults with the Catholic Church? I haven't done research on that specifically, and, and obviously the data was too general to get into specific programs, but I know from the Going, Going, Gone book and from some other qualitative research, uh, the finding seems to be that there are just, there are some vibrant pockets of, um, of, of belief and practice, and that some of these things uh, that uh, folks are involved in uh, in their youth are transformative experiences that sort of keep them involved um, for the rest of their lives. So I think um, from what I know of those programs, the uh, they're, they're doing good work um, creating community and creating um, bonds for uh, people with the church. Um, and and back, back to the question about consensus, you know, I wonder if, I wonder if a way to get people together would be to to have like um, the Jesuit Social Research Institute will get people ha they have teach-ins on say immigration and they they get people together and, and talk and uh, and and people one of the the neat things is uh, um, is that people uh, is is that uh, when people at, at these events, they have immigrants talk, and when people, when the immigrants share their experience, it's kind of transformative. It's like it, it humanizes them, and and so you know maybe getting people together to to you know share and discuss uh, situations like that, where you can humanize people in different situations, could be a way of of of, of doing that. So anyway. Um, that's a, a thought I have. So there's a few other questions here. Yes, a comment, maybe some uh, Catholics go to church to meet their own needs. That is one of the great challenges of social science, sort of recognizing that, um, you know, there are a lot of individual stories out there um, while also trying to make generalizations about the whole. And I think it's important to acknowledge that, um, you know, if we, uh, if we were to talk to some of these people uh, who responded to the survey, we'd, we'd probably get a lot of really rich and really distinctive stories about their their relationship uh, with, with, with church and, and what they think about and what they do in those contexts. Um, someone who's interested in the Pew survey results and um, more about the nuns and nuns, um, they say they're going to go to the website. Definitely recommend Pew as a resource. They're just uh, doing really, really great work. I think you can sign up for a newsletter. Um, lots of, of, of reports that are of a manageable length to read. They're really good at infographics, too. They have very, very pretty um, uh, graphs with lots of um, very clear, concise information. Uh, and then do you see small faith communities, small Christian communities being a solution to more young people? If yes, how? That is a great question. Um, and actually, the next book on my like to read list is um, a book by a colleague of mine, um, just a wonderful sociologist of Catholicism, uh, Trisha Bruce. She's at Maryville College, um, and she's written a couple of, uh, of important um, books in the sociology of Catholicism. Um, and the last one that she wrote was on personal parishes, so parishes that have been formed around um, affinity communities. Um, and I think uh, from hearing her give some presentations on uh, that work uh, before the book came out, it, it sounds like there's something really special about those places because of their smallness and their chosenness and their sort of bringing together of, of like-minded individuals sometimes demographically different individuals, but sort of like like-minded in that small context. So I think that's a really interesting idea. I, I personally am interested in learning more about that. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure right. being with you all.
All right. And, and everybody else, thank you all for joining us and, uh, and join us on, on November 2nd for our event on the, on the Senate and a book release. So thank you so much.